You are your only limit. Hello, you beautiful people, and welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast, presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's unleashing creativity to grow their business. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you can email me at max at hippodirect.com for any podcasting or digital marketing help. This is episode number 36, and today's guest is Chelsea Cross. She is the leading millennial expert who first made a name for herself with her radio show back when she was 16, and since then has grown her brand and several Fortune 500 brands to new heights. Here are the best way to market to millennials in the power of influencer marketing and personal branding. It's time to get crossed. Enjoy the show. All righty. We are here with Chelsea Cross, America's leading millennial marketing expert. And would you believe that she is a millennial herself, just like yours truly? How are you doing today, Chelsea? Hey, Max. Doing great. Thanks. Of course. Well, I'm so glad you you were able to take the time to join us. Uh, We're going to talk about a lot of very, very cool things today, um, including your backstory, which is just fascinating to me because, you know, uh, around the time that you were starting your radio show and getting sort of into the content and uh, and strategic marketing world, I was just focused on not dropping passes and football (laughs) football practice in the football field and uh, and trying to make the baseball team. So... (laughs) A little bit different. Hey, I was doing that. I was doing it at the same time too. You know, I was, I was as much as I was hosting radio show and do it. I was, you know, still totally being your typical teenager, dancing and horseback riding, and you know, hanging with friends. Just right. Just also had the side hustle going on a little earlier. Most. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing because I, I thought I was busy in high school and you kind of took that to a whole new level, you know, <laughs> before you even got to college. So that's insane. But for anybody that's not familiar with your brand yet, do you mind giving a little brief background of how you got started, um, how your career has progressed kind of into a few different mediums here? Well, I guess several sure. different mediums. And what's the biggest thing you're focused on today? Definitely. Well, I'll try to keep that short and concise, Um, (laughs) but it is a 12 year story at this point. As long as you don't take 12 years to tell it. As long as it doesn't take 12 years. How do I, how do I sum up 12 years in 12 seconds? (laughs) Um, But long story short, I was a high school student, you know, going to public school in South Florida and it was truly 2007, 2008. So social media was in its infancy. The iPhone was in its infancy. There was no such thing as like, you know, a digital platform for teenagers to come together, be inspired, communicate, um, empower one another, and also just kind of get out of your community bubble, right? Like there, right. now we have access and reach and exposure to things globally. Um, it's kind of hard to wrap around, you know, wrap your head around the fact that just 10 years ago, it was a completely different landscape. So oh, yeah. This was the time of, you know, 16 and pregnant on MTV and uh, That's So Raven and Hannah Montana. And that was really- Oh my God. All my favorite shows. Right? I mean, that was prime programming at this time. So I was, you know, as much as, hey, gotta love That's So Raven and Hannah Montana, I was a little over it and wanted more. And, (laughs) (laughs) And it was also about the time where every news affiliate, every one of my mega mentors, you know, Barbara Walters, Diane Sawyer, Oprah, all of my favorite women were talking so negatively about the next generation. The word millennial didn't even exist at this time. We were the teenagers, AKA lazy, entitled, narcissistic. We've been hearing this for 10 years already. And (laughs) I kid you not, I heard the demise of the future. And when I heard that we were the demise of the future, I was just, I started laughing out loud. And I said to myself, well, this is really empowering us to do something with ourselves as a generation. And I, you know, going to public school, I looked around at all of my, my friends and we were so hungry for success. Max, we were, had a list of colleges we were applying to, SAT, Mm -hmm. prep, right? Just working so hard to get to that next step, college, to better yourself. Right. 
I, you know, it was bullying, cyberbullying, body image, uh, STDs, teen, uh, teen pregnancy. Um, these were all topics swirling in the media, yet no platform for our peers to have a voice come together, let alone, you know, just connect with like-minded people. Wow. And that really was, you know, frustration fueled inspiration for me. And I always say, hey, a lot of us are frustrated in the world. How can you take that frustration and channel it into something creative, right? right. And, you know, passion turns to profit. Frustration should lead to creativity or trying to find some solution of whatever you're frustrated about. Mine was programming, lack of conversation, lack of empowerment, and put together a radio talk show concept called Teen Talk Live, my 16-year-old self, Teen Talk Live, and hooked it to a Clear Channel Studios in, in, South, in, in you know, South Florida down here, and three months later was our very first live show. Wow. And Max, never did I imagine that this was going to be the start to a career, because how could I even think that? you know, in the landscape of no social media, no, no such thing as bloggers, influencers, you know, you know, social thought leaders. There was just, there was no um, inspiration to think of it as a career. It was more of a passion project. And truly, I thought maybe it would make me stand out in all these college applications and help okay. me get into college. You right. know? Well, that, that is <laughs> quite the resume booster. So I think you've achieved that, Mark. <laughs> okay, this is something not every resume is going to have. So that was my mindset for starting this show. But mm. three months into the show, we had every single news affiliate, every single news station in the studio covering the concept. Oh my God, this teenager, producer and host of this teenage show talking to fellow teenagers. What a concept, you know? <laughs> and, and, um, it was just, there was nothing like it. It was a little bit ahead of the time. I believe that timing is also a major equation in success today. And oh, yeah, totally. I seized the opportunity. I saw that there was a lack in the market. I saw that there was a niche to fulfill. And my 16-year-old entrepreneurial self just felt in my gut that this was something I needed to do. Um, and the, the crazy thing that happened was, you know, after three, six months of all these news affiliates um, covering the show, I realized that our demographic was not just teenagers, it was baby boomers gen and Gen Xers. We were appealing to across the board generations. And it was just as many parents and grandparents were emailing into the show, calling into the show, because they too were so interested in the mindset of the next generation, how to relate, appeal, communicate, market to the next generation. So that's what started kind of bringing in my marketing component when I realized that it was more than just this program for, for teenagers. Right. And everything changed in 2009 when I put together my first mission trip to Africa on behalf mm -hmm. of feminine hygiene care and brought along the CBS and Fox camera with me. And upon coming back to the States and putting a four-part docu-series together with CBS and Fox, you by Kotex asked me to be their millennial spokesperson and help them build the brand you by Kotex, which was the first ever brand really catering to that teenage demographic. Um, and that was a one-year agreement that turned into five years working together. I helped build the UBI Kotex brand from scratch. It was truly the, the, the boom of influencer marketing. Think about it. Kotex mm -hmm. was tapping this everyday girl, Chelsea Frost, to be their spokesperson, not a Demi Lovato or Selena Gomez of the world, this everyday <laughs> person, right? And I call it, you know, the best thing that ever happened to me and also my master's in influencer marketing. Um, it was five years of creating what influencer marketing was for you by Kotex, but the foundation of what we use for influencer marketing for all brands and businesses today. So that's the very long, you know, beginning story of, of how I kind of got to where I am today. But 10 years later, I get to wear both hats and I get to be talent and brand ambassador for my clients, as well as work on behind the scenes as, as strategist and consultant. So I like to say I have my cake and eat it too, because I get to do <laughs> both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes for, for all clients today. Wow. And, and who doesn't like cake? So I, it sounds like you're uh, enjoying what you're doing. So, I love but, but that's really <laughs> cool. It, it's really neat from, from your story there that there's there are really a few different moments that you can really point to and say, you know, that's where everything changed. I think one of those pivotal moments and maybe the hardest moment for anybody when they're getting started is that 
part where you just get started and you have to pitch someone on an idea and you really get rolling. And I know you did that when you were 16. Were you 16 at the time that you started the radio show or is that even before that? It was, uh, I think the concept, I was creating it, you know, at 15. I don't even think I had my license yet. But by the time <laughs> I... That's sat, amazing, yeah. Right? By the time I sat down in the room with the president of the station and, you know, the show got greenlit, I was 16 years old. Wow. Okay. And so yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think it's really cool that you spoke of all your frustration and you turned that frustration into creativity. You turned it into that idea. But where did the actual confidence come from to say, hey, you know what? I can do this. And, and I don't care if no other teenager or nobody else my age is doing a radio show like this. I want to do it. And I think there's a, an opportunity for it. You know, I, okay, that's such a golden question, Max, because I, there's a, oh, I, thank I you. A, it's, it, <laughs> you would think that it would be a little um, easier for me to answer, but I feel like there's a few variables. And think about mm-hmm. your 16-year-old self, kind of like ignorance is bliss, you know, being a little naive to the world, right? Yeah, you know, binge watching That's So Raven. and this, the, Right, I, <laughs> I, I think the fact that I was young and a little less exposed to the world made me have less fear about going in and pitching this idea because I had nothing to lose right well I I I wasn't trying I wasn't on Shark Tank I don't Shark Tank didn't even exist right I wasn't on national (laughs) nobody who saw me do what I did did was doing in the room so I just realized that I had nothing to lose so I think that really helped me give me the confidence that hey if this doesn't work I'm going back to my everyday life nothing's changing you know Mm mm-hmm Slash, I had, um, upon telling my, my closest friends that I was thinking about doing the show, my three best friends in the entire world, Max, stopped talking to me and said, who do you think you are? Oh, my God. Uh, that's so millennial of them. I'm, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just so kidding. So kind, <laughs> so generous, uh, so supportive, the complete antithesis of why I wanted to start the show in the first place. That's so hard. I mean, we, we've all been teenagers and that's such a crazy time in your life that I can yeah. imagine if like three of my best friends just stop. Like, stop. The- stop talking to me. Who do you think you are? And, you know, of course, you know, <laughs> spreading the rumor about me behind my back. And, um, you know, for whether I'm sure you can relate and so many people listening can relate to a mm-hmm. time where they were bullied or just... Uh, felt so such a lack of support from what their what was supposed to be their close friends, and I had a moment where I had a total breakdown. My mom found me hysterically crying in my closet with like hives all over my chest. I can't do this. Oh my god, my best friends don't even support me. How is anybody else going to support me? And my mom, in the in the most nice way possible, literally slapped me across the face and said, "Get yourself together." And she basically said, if you're going to let these three, you know, teenage girls stop you from starting something, what does that mean for the rest of your life? Wow. That, co- that closet conversation, I kid you not, this is in the, in the floor of my closet, <laughs> totally changed my life forever, Max, because I realized in that moment I could let the bullies win or... I could pursue my own path. I could pursue my own destiny and let, let the door either open or close because I chose to do it, not because my friends weren't supporting me. So, you know, I kind of feel like there's breakdown for breakthrough moments all throughout our life, all throughout our career. And I could, I could think of certain breakdown moments that led to breakthroughs that ultimately yeah. helped catapult my career or success that much more. And that closet moment of, you know, hyperventilating, I can't do this, was a breakdown for a breakthrough uh, because it really gave me the confidence to walk into that station and not give a shit, excuse my language. About no. Oh, well, what, you can swear. <laughs> uh, well, not give a flying shit of what, <laughs> anybody else thought of my concept other than what the station thought at that moment. And um, I think the fact that I had a, have an amazing family support system has always given me the confidence to at least try anything that I thought was worthy, let alone succeed or fail at it. You know, at right. least give it a try. Yeah, exactly. You know, what's, what's the downside? If you fail at something, so what? You know, it's not the last opportunity you'll ever have. Some, some of us are so scared of failure, Max, but in the moment of failure, it sucks so hard, right? Failure mm-hmm. is the worst black and blue mark because you never know when it's that, that bruise is going to fade. But 
at some point, it could be in a month, it could be in a year, it could be two years, it could be two weeks, there's going to be a silver lining that reveals itself. That aha mm -hmm. moment, that lesson learned, that life skill, that experience that will change the game for you moving forward. So we just have to be open and receptive to what those silver lining moments are in, in all failures that we experience. Right, absolutely. And I'm kind of getting a sense that the movie Mean Girls was in part inspired by you. So it could be uh, a little bit of that mean story. Mean Girls <laughs> was, was such a part of the whole time frame of it all this, really was. Right, of all this negative chatter because we had only the worst representation of our generation within programming. It was right. Mean Girls, it was, it was uh, 16 and Pregnant, it was Jersey Shore, it was Nicole Richie, Paris Hilton. Yeah, the there was Bowman. so, oh my God, so many uh, TV, MTV oh yeah. shows in VH1. It, oh my God, there was so much. It was just nothing powerful and empowering and entrepreneurial, none of it, none of it. So I was just like, this got to change here. <laughs> it's really, really cool that you sort of flipped that upside down and didn't give a flying shit, as someone would say. Not a flying shit. <laughs> So that's kind of how you got started in the radio world. And you've obviously had tons of success and it, your role in radio really at the start propelled you to get appearances on TV and have success in the TV world. You've done a lot of stuff offline with your mission trips and speaking. You've done your, you know, your huge influencer and in social media and huge, even have your own LinkedIn course. So for anybody that is thinking of approaching a new media platform, you know, whether that be TV, whether that be social media, what advice do you have? How do you approach any new platform that you're about to dive in on? Well, that's a great, another great question. I think that um, <laughs> Thank you, we, have to, we, <laughs> we have to actually go back even further before we get to the platform. Mm -hmm. it, Max, this is such an important element in success today that I don't think we focus on enough. And I think because of this instant gratification society that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's sending a message to the world in a 240 character tweet and literally whether it's you know florida or africa we can see this message upon hitting send if it's amazon prime we have something delivered to us that's 24 hours you know look at companies like blue apron and hello fresh we don't even want to go to the grocery store and and decide what to cook anymore it's like it comes at your door for you ready to prepare right there's such instant gratification so I think this instant gratification mindset or lifestyle also does bleed into how we perceive business and entrepreneurship and, and influence of like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to start a YouTube channel and then overnight I'm going to have a million subscribers. And then, you know, within the first year of YouTube, I'm going to make a million revenue. Right. That, well, that's exactly how it happens. Right. <laughs> exactly how it happens. And for anybody who thinks it's exactly how it happens, you know, we, we need to talk. You, because it's really, <laughs> because it's really this distortion of reality, right? It so, is, yeah. what makes people successful today? What makes people influential today? What makes brands or entrepreneurs build following and generate traffic and monetize their presence today? It all starts with a solid foundation. So uh, that's why I, I usually do take the time to explain the beginnings of my journey because Max, people Google Chelsea Frost or they look at, you know, my, my, my personal brand or digital footprint and they don't realize that it's been 12 years in making. My foundation started 12 years ago in local AM radio. That's my <laughs> foundation in producing and hosting radio. Within, after three years, 16, 17, 18, by the time I was 18, CBS and Fox asked me if I would start producing and hosting segments on the news catered toward millennials. Okay, so that, see how I just layered on to the foundation that I had built. Now I'm moving from radio to TV. In 2008 or 9, it started to become Twitter, like the Twitter momentum. You know, like Twitter was it. And in 2009, I dedicated my energy and attention to building Twitter. In 2012, I launched Millennial Talk Twitter Chat, which was another layer to my foundation on Twitter, which was another layer in generating a following, generating traffic, and also monetizing my Twitter presence. So it's all about the layering effect with creating a solid foundation first. Now that solid foundation doesn't have to be a platform like a radio show, it can be a skill set. 
It could be, a, are, you, are you dominating in skill set of coding, engineering, graphic design, app builds, Facebook ads, Google ads? What, what is your skill set that you could dominate in and build yourself a solid foundation in, right? That you are an right, expert yep. in this skill set. Become an expert, dominate the, the, the landscape, build some clientele, right? Get some uh, powerful testimonials, and then layer on top of that skill set to create larger offerings um, and a larger footprint on, on social media. Now, you know, you dominate in building apps, but now you're also building websites, right? So now you are right. able to expand out all while on brand, all while um, be, being very aware of who your target demographic or client is, all while expanding on your skill set set to continue to broaden, beef in your experience, your service offerings, and your revenue streams. So again, a long-winded answer, but I think some of these things need a bigger description. They need a bigger, we need to take a little bit more time to not just get to the million follower YouTube channel. It's had it, what was the foundation that got them there, right? Gary V had to start somewhere. He started in his family's wine business. Okay, yep. so him understanding the business, wine business, the, the, the marketing footprint ultimately led him closer and closer to VaynerMedia. So it's mm -hmm. like everybody has a foundation somewhere. What is yours? What, that skill set is going to help you define where you should be online. So if your skill set is, you know, coding and design, where does coding and design people hang out most on social media? If it's PR and fashion, we know that's going to be Instagram and Twitter, right? So it's understanding your foundation, your skill set, and then where your audience is on social media, and that's where you, that's where you should be. Right. And don't be too hard on yourself with the long-winded. I don't think you're long-winded, but take as much wind as you'd like. <laughs> yes. You know, I always say that we, we are running really fast as a society, but sometimes we're moving fast and nowhere. Uh, we're, we're, we're going, we're moving fast, but going nowhere fast, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And there's so many people that are so busy all day, right? They're so busy. They don't have a moment to sit down. They don't have a minute to put food in their mouth. But what are they accomplishing at the end of the day? Is it just a mm -hmm. bunch of meetings and conversations? Or are you executing and taking action moving you forward? And being busy to be busy doesn't make you look any more important. I'm sorry. You know, so it's, it's <laughs> really carving, carving out what you have to do to ultimately get you to the next step, the next right. level. I don't, I don't, the whole looking busy to, or the whole just, you know, adding your calendar to look like you're important is ridiculous. And there's so, I'm calling people out. There's a lot of people that do that. And that's getting you nowhere fast. Bam, drop the mic, will you? Uh, you know, no, but I, I completely agree. And I, I love your points on the establishing a foundation because it's so true. And if you look at any entrepreneur or anybody that's had tons of success in the model, modern digital era, they all have that really strong foundation and backstory. Once you're at that point and you have this foundation and you've had a lot of success in certain mediums, what is it that makes you decide to go all in on something. I, you mentioned that in, in 2009, you went all in on Twitter. What is it nowadays that sort of piques your interest and say, you know, okay, I really have to focus on this this year? Um, you know what? That is a great question. And I really believe that what... I'm, <laughs> You're I, too kind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I like good questions. I do, as you can tell. <laughs> Appreciate it. Oh, I love good answers. So, <laughs> I like to call myself a realist more than an optimist, Max. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that you know. Oh, you put it out there; it just made, you manifest greatness. You put something out there that you think has real potential, and then manifest the greatness. Right from from the research that you've done, from the conversations that you've had, from the experience that's led you to that idea. Do you have a viable concept? Have you done the market research? What does the competitive analysis look like? What is the budget that you need to make that idea come to life? What's the time commitment of this concept to bring it to life? These are all things you need to flush through before you start moving on this idea, okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes crowdsourcing could be your best friend. Is the market demanding it? Is the market in need of it? How are you assessing market demand? 
You can do it with polls, Instagram, Twitter polls, Facebook polls. How are you crowdsourcing mm -hmm. feedback from your audience to know if the market is demanding this idea or concept? So if, that, if the market demand is there, after you've done the research, the competitive analysis, you've looked at uh, you know, what revenue might be needed to make this concept come to life, what does your time commitment look like in regards to making, you know, taking action on all of these items? Once market demands that, is that's when I start really putting an action plan into place and assessing you know, how I'm going to move forward with this and prioritizing what I already have on my plate, but prioritizing the time I need to make to make this action item happen. So I'm really big on the research and the crowdsourcing component to help right. take market interest, market demand. Yeah. And just hearing your answers here, you can just tell how important that groundwork is to you. So it's, it's really, really cool. It's not just, you know, jumping to new platforms at surface level. It's really, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes before you even get to that point. So I love that. Absolutely. Even if you're like, you know, thinking you want to start a YouTube channel. Okay, great. You might have a great concept for the content you want to create for it, but how much do you know about YouTube? How much do you know about title, tags, edit, um, descriptions, you know, hyperlinks, all of these things that actually help make your videos pop through the clutter. So don't just think about your creative or your content. It's actually about making your creative and content come to life, right, through the platform that you're publishing it on. So right. you might need to do some foundational training in YouTube for business, right? So this is, these are the, this is the mindset that I talk about in foundation to just further be defining your skill set, broadening your skill set to help dominate your foundation. And because think about uh, think about building a house. If you lay down the concrete slab and then you start putting the bricks on, right? And that concrete slab isn't dry, and you start putting all the bricks on. We know that concrete slab is going to cave in. So right. the more solid that foundation slab is, the bigger the mega mansion can be. <laughs> yeah, well, and appreciate it because you're going to get all of our listeners to build their own house. So <laughs> I'm all about the the mega mansion building here. Can you imagine getting a 100% open rate on your next marketing message? Well, you can with extra large postcards that are impossible to ignore. Hippo Direct can help you find the perfect list of proven direct mail responders. We can even help lay out and design the postcard for you. Check us out at hippodirect.com. You are America's leading millennial expert, so I feel like we should talk about millennials for a little bit if that's all right with you. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's talk about marketing to millennials. So, you know, it's a topic that gets discussed a lot and, you know, you know very well, you know, there's tons of directions we could go with this, but I want to keep it down to its simplest form. If somebody asks you, what's a bit of advice, how can I best appeal to millennials from a marketing standpoint? What's the simplest advice that you'd give there? Ooh, okay. So... <laughs> you don't like that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. It's a hard one. That's what we're here for. <laughs> right? I, I think it's more than just one thing. I think it's about a combination of things that ultimately make marketing to millennials effective. So right. if, I could, if I could boil it down, Max, to one thing, I think that would be personalizing our marketing messaging. And what do I mean mm -hmm. by that? As millennial consumers today, and, you know, aside from millennials, as consumers today, we really get drawn to products or services that speak our language, right? If you're right. watching, a, whether it's a, 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 like a traditional commercial on television or a ad that comes up in your Instagram feed, if that description, visual, video is speaking your language, then you are that much more likely to stop and listen versus something that's just so, you know, far out. So understanding who your target client is, and okay, so within millennials, we're about like 22 to 38-ish. Um, we're a very broad age range, which makes mm -hmm. it actually that much more complicated for people to, I'm doing air quotes, market to <laughs> Right. Um, because I like to, I actually break up six micro markets within the overall generation and it's mm -hmm. college students, it's boomerang babies, it's millennial hustlers, it's millennial mom and dad and millennials at heart. And within each of those micro markets, you have a little, you have a different age range, you have different interests and behaviors, you also have different incomes 
all of that makes a difference for how you're marketing to that segment. You with me? Yeah, I, I'm totally, I, you know, I feel I've never felt more millennial. <laughs> so <laughs> understanding which micro market within the overall broad millennial generation is really going to help you refine personalizing that messaging. So mm -hmm. personalizing that messaging also means personalizing that content, right? Because right. content is messaging today. So really personal, not the, there's no such thing as one size fits all marketing today. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as thinking all millennials think alike, act the same, spend the same. So it's really about boiling down to who are your micro markets and then personalizing your message and your content for that audience. I would say that's of the number one most important today. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a really great point. And as far as the language goes, I mean, language can mean resonating with them as far as the overall message, or it can mean, you know, more specifically, the actual language that you're using, the actual copy that you have in your messaging. So what, uh, I got another tricky one for you here. What advice do you have for brands to speak millennials language or speak consumers language without it seeming forced or over the top? Because you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Twitter account brand saying Bay, B-A-E, but there's all the, like brands can get made fun of if they're trying yeah. to use too much slang and too much language for younger generations that just doesn't seem to fit with the overall brand. You, you know it's not authentic, right? Exactly. Um, and I think, I think that's, the, that's like the total happy medium or, or um, that fine line that brands need to find where their, their messaging is feeling authentic and resonates with their brand, but also appeals to the consumer they're trying to interest. And just putting in a bunch of emojis or slang words, you know we're going to read through that BS. So, <laughs> right. One of, one of the ways to really personalize our marketing messaging for brands today is to actually collaborate with influencers in that space. So if it's mm -hmm. a beauty brand, to work with beauty influencers and bloggers. If it's a financial product or service, to work with finance influencers, experts, bloggers, thought leaders. So that the brand is collaborating with these thought leaders that are relevant within their industry, that have their own voice, right? Their own authentic voice that already have have um peaked interest in their in their followers right for these influencers mm -hmm. built in communities it's right. a great way for a brand to have their brand messaging all with that authentic spin from the influencer's perspective and and the way that they're creating the content or the way, the, the way that they're taking the brand message and and sharing it through storytelling with their audience so i right. think that's why influencer marketing is the biggest marketing trend for 2018 and 2019. It's the mm -hmm. fastest customer acquisition strategy that marketing has ever seen. And I think it makes a lot of sense because of the exact thing you just said of like brands being inauthentic because they're trying to they're trying to appeal too much like like so versus collaborating with someone who is like so. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. I think that's the happy medium there of mm -hmm. and why brands finding the right influencers is essential because the, those influencers are you're right the, the spokespeople, the publicists, the the brand ambassador on behalf of the brand service product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think your term the right influencer is so important because the it's growing and growing as a marketing strategy. You know, partnering with influencers and it can work so well for businesses, but it has to be the right tie. And of course, you, you hear the horror stories like Firefest, notably. But um, I think more often than not, more often than not, there is a lot and lot of upside of working with influencers in this day and age, as long as you pick out the right ones that are great partners. You got it. And I think Fire Festival is a great example for us to all learn from, right? Their, their <laughs> totally. breakdown was all of our breakthroughs. You know, like we got to benefit yep. from, unfortunately, their crazy failure. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I would say that the brand that Fire Life Festival was trying to create and emulate was that exclusive, quality, high-end kind of 1% vibe, right? And mm -hmm. all of those models fit that brand identity. Yet what they did so wrong was not be transparent with all of those influencers and models of what the fire festival actually was, what it was going to be, what it was going to sound like, right? All right. of these girls went in so blind. And to me, that's management's fault. All those girls are represented by, you know, mega agents, how those agents let that yeah. slide, shame on them. I don't think it's necessarily shame on the girls. I really don't. Mm -hmm. 
That's why you have management. That's why you have representation. All of those girls have both plus some. Right. But I think the biggest thing that we learned was that none of the girls were hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored. None of the, no, nobody knew how the, the correlation between the influencer, the Empire Festival, which that lack of transparency is only going to come back and bite you hard. You know, if you're doing that today, FTC compliance, Federal Trade Commission compliance will mm -hmm. never be the same because of Fire, Fire Festival. So all <laughs> brands and influencers who want to collaborate, you know, we have to make sure that the messaging is right and that we're being super transparent to the audience we're sharing it with because all of us have a, have a duty to, you know, represent what we're advocating for to our audience and to our community. And I think that's what makes us and will help us sustain being influencers today. Right on. And, and while we're on this millennial topic, the, I, there's one more thing I want to bring up. I want to shout out your Twitter chat because it is amazing and it's so cool to see how much it has grown. So hashtag millennial talk and it's Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time, correct? Yes. So it's amazing. And speaking of influencers, you partner with a lot of the top names in business. And it's just amazing. You know, the conversations you have, the great questions you ask as part of that chat. So anybody that's active on Twitter, even if you're not active, but you have that Twitter, you haven't been on in a while, check out Chelsea's Millennial Talk Twitter chat. It's so cool. Chelsea, going back to sort of the origin, what made you start that Twitter chat in the first place? Well, thank you for the Millennial Talk love and shout out. Of course. I, you know what? It, this was actually a great example of market demand and, and me just assessing the need. Uh, so I was hosting um, Teen Talk Live, which when I turned 20 kind of evolved into the Chelsea Cross show, being that I wasn't a teenager anymore. <laughs> and uh, I had been hosting the show for five years, I want to say. And as Twitter grew in popularity, I would encourage everyone to pull up their Twitter feed and, and join me in the conversation. So if they had a question, if they had a thought, they had an opinion, if they had a, a conflicting opinion, I love to loop everybody into the actual show live. So it's like a live Twitter chat, but right. listen to the radio show. So as I started to say that every show, I realized that we just started getting more people tweeting, 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 even to the point where that I was getting distracted, right? Because it's hard for me to look at the tweets and listen to what the person was saying. And I said, you know, all this chatter on Twitter is exactly what I'm looking for because I, I'm really big mad on talking with people, not necessarily at people. And I think right. that's people learn and really network. And I said, this is really what I've been trying to do here is create this type of conversation. Let me see if I can just solely generate conversation on Twitter alone and maybe not even have the radio show component. So instead mm. of me interviewing the guests on the radio and chatting with everyone, why can't I interview the guests on Twitter with everybody participating, engaging, asking questions, chiming in. So actually the radio show gave me the inspiration for the Twitter chat because of how I was using Twitter at the time. So I saw that there was market demand or market interest for really wanting to participate more. And that's what gave me the inspiration for turning it into an actual chat on Twitter, aka Twitter chat. Um, and really that was how Millennial Talk was born. Wow. It's, it's so cool. Just, you know, dissecting your career path here. You really are. Each thing is tied to the previous and it's really adding on another layer to that foundation. So 100%. Yeah. It's really cool. Everything keeps going back to that. Uh, let's change gears a little bit. I want to hit on creativity because it's very important mm -hmm. for anybody in business out there or even, you know, wide range of industries. So I uh, think about things that inspire you, how you stay creative. First question here, what do you do to stay creative? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> Thanks again. That's a very good one. I said, pat yourself on the back, Max. Um, Thank you. I, I've been patting this whole time, yeah. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. I, feel, I, I really believe that it's, you know, everybody has to find what, what fills them. And that's, that, that's ultimately going to, you know, channel your creative juices or, or help, you know, generate your creative juices. For mm -hmm. me, it's being outside, it's being in nature, it's being with animals, it's actually mm -hmm. totally removing myself from the digital landscape. The more far away I am from digital and tech, the more my creative juices flow. 
I grew up horseback riding, so I'm a you know barn rat. Love getting dirty in the barn. Uh, love love being on that horse, feeling free and powerful. And feeling free and powerful helps you feel confident in creative thinking. So that could be mm -hmm. someone running on the treadmill. That could be someone running outside. That could be someone playing with their child outside. That could be someone journaling at night. But everybody has to find what gets their creative juices flowing. I, I believe that there's a lot of inspiration we could seek from social media, from podcasts, from Facebook live streams. But at the end of the day, you have to turn your devices off. You have to unplug in order to reboot. Right, if we just let our yeah. phones go all the time, we would drain the battery. That's yeah. what we do to our brains all day. We're, we're on Twitter, we're on email, we're on Instagram, we're, we're Zooming, we're podcasting, the amount of tabs I'm looking at while, while we're chatting is, is ridiculous right now. <laughs> but we're always multitasking, right? And we're bombarded with information. We are consuming so much content in a day we don't even you know, acknowledge. And in order to, for, to give us the space to unplug, to me, is the ultimate, the only way to let your creative tank fill. And a lot of people have said to me, Max, like, wow, you, so you, you live primarily in Florida? Like, do you not feel that you're missing out or not exposed or on the outs that you're not living in a New York or a LA anymore? Upon moving back to Florida after living in New York and LA for 10 years, <clears throat> just three years ago, I moved back to Florida. My business tripled, Max. Really? My business tripled. Now, I think business tripled because, one, I had the biggest failure of my life in 2016, and it ultimately led to the most inspiring, creative growth learning lessons. But I also do believe that me personally living in Florida and not being in the crazy hustle and bustle creates more space for me to create mm -hmm. and think and try something new. Um, so again, you know, we all have to look within. It's not what works for Chelsea is gonna work for me. It's not what works for Max, what works for me. But I always hope to inspire people to look within of what fuels you. What gives you that space? What gives you that creative flexibility and freedom and clarity? And find that for yourself. If you're not taking a me moment every day, a me moment means it's selfishly for you, right? Then that you need to. Because those me moments are going to only help inspire, create those creative juices for you and not lead to that brain burnout moment. And no one wants that. And if you don't mind, briefly, do you mind sharing what that failure was in 2016 that you spoke about? No, absolutely. So I was living in California. I had partnered with a co-founder to create my uh, a digital media production company. And at the time, this was 2012 or 13. And it, there again, the boom of all these influencer agencies and all these agencies that were taking a network of influencers and uh, a brand and aligning influencers to collaborate and create all the content for the brand, all influencer marketing, digital content. We were again a little bit on the cusp of this. Realized that there was such a demand in the market, put together an amazing team, or what I thought was an amazing team at the time, and we <laughs> made a half a million dollars. And we had an amazing six space in Santa Monica. Within our first year, we had worked with um, Dunkin' Donuts, Coca-Cola, really amazing brands. Unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, my career was also growing at the time of launching the, the Impulse, which was the digital media company, the Impulse. And I was getting still all these inquiries to speak across the country and to do Milano Top Chats and really work as an influencer along with building the Impulse. But in my, I only saw it as beneficial because I, I was help my personal brand was helping bring attention and clients to Impulse, right? And that's the power of personal branding. So mm. I realized that that dynamic amongst my co-founders was not comfortable. You know, it was started to become a little, there was friction there of like, oh, she's leaving again. And uh, oh, she's on, <laughs> on the go again. Little did, mind you, Max, every dollar that I was generating through my personal brand, I was putting back into the impulse. 
Right. So I was not taking a salary, helping the company grow while working double time to generate revenue through Chelsea Cross, but to, you know, drive revenue back to the business, which is what we do with business owners, right? Right. However, my partners were not doing the same. And I ended up realizing that there was a lot of things going on behind my back that weren't cool. Uh, The way that money was being spent wasn't cool. And it all came to a head when I had to fly home to Florida because my grandfather was dying and was in Florida for his funeral and was getting all these videos and text messages from interns at the impulse of all the hoopla that was going on in the office. Oh, wow. So I realized that the company was a different company when I was there versus when I wasn't. Right. And it really just, you know, they knew where I was. I was at a funeral. They knew that I was working double time. I was the only one not taking a salary, working double time to put my own money into the company. And it just became this toxic relationship of Mm -hmm. where, and it was my fault, Max. I, it was my fault because I expected my partners to do the same that I was doing. It wasn't a mutual agreement. I just thought, oh, if I'm doing it, they should be doing it. Right? Right. That wasn't the case. It was never agreed upon situation. So what hurt the most was that it was a business failure. It was a friendship loss and it was a financial loss all at one time with a family member loss. So I got hit with like four different losses at one time. It put me into the deepest depression I've ever been in because you know what? Financial loss hurts. But sometimes when you're, when you think you're, these people are to the point where these people were my, my wedding, Max, you know, who I was working with and then the way that they treated me behind my back in front of me, the deceit, the lies, disappointment actually hurt the most, you know, and then it just was all, all wrapped in losing my grandfather, who was everything to our family. So it was just a really, really, really bad time filled with such negative, toxic, energy and I realized that within the entire experience of building impulse I never let my personal brand die it only grew and my personal brand was bringing so much validity and traffic and influence to the company and I realized wow the power of personal branding is so extraordinary extraordinary because someone's personal brand could help make or break the actual business component and that's what made me appreciate my personal brand like nobody else because my impulse crumbled. But the next day, I was monetizing because Chelsea Cross existed, right? Mm-hmm, right. The, the ability for us to all be thinking about building our personal brand to help bring more opportunity and revenue to our business is something we should all be thinking about moving into 2019 because we all have the ability to build a digital footprint today and really open up additional opportunities which open up additional revenue streams for, for business. Um, so all of, all of these aha moments came to me within this you know, epic failure. Yeah. Oh, well, Max, sometimes we are doing things that we shouldn't be doing. And I realized that I was putting my energy into impulse where I needed to be putting my energy into building Chelsea Productions. Um, So it was a blessing. You know, there's another silver lining in many different ways. And it was just loss on top of loss on top of loss. And ultimately, it was six months of darkness. There's a six-month period, Max, I really don't remember. I just, I was so depressed and dark and all on Chelsea Productions, but in 2017, I got asked to speak at the first ever 10X Growth Con, Grant Cardone's 10X Growth Yeah, yeah, Grant Cardone, yeah. And I was really in the depths of my depression at this moment, and I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to seize this opportunity. I am speaking in front of a million entrepreneurs that have all experienced failure and triumph within their career, and it was the first speaking engagement that I actually shared my failure story. I shared everything about the impulse on the 10X stage. I had never... um, had a story like that to really share so vulnerably and it was the most beautiful part of the experience of of connecting with everyone in regards to their failure and what they learned through their failure and I ultimately launched um, my signature program Millennial Marketing Formula at 10x and sold 60 programs from stage within 30 minutes of speaking (laughs) so it was kind of this again breakdown to evaluate and realize 
what people needed, how people, how people could reevaluate failure. And again, I evaluated what market demand need was to put together a program that I thought was a helpful solution. And again, that's another common theme of, of our entire time together, Max, is to really evaluate market demand, market need, and then utilize your experience and your skill set to provide a solution. Oh, totally. You know, I think that's kind of the ebbs and flows of how, I, how I've been able to grow. Well, that's truly incredible. Such a powerful story. And, and uh, I'm really sorry to hear about your tough times. Like that sounds like, you know, going through hell and appreciate you sharing everything. And, but it's, it's so inspiring how you've, from that moment, everything has been up and you really have achieved so much success since then. And really it took some of those dark times for you to really get it out and focus on what was the most important for your career. So, so kudos. That, that's, in, that's incredible. Thank you. And you know what, Max, if I could leave any, everyone with one piece of advice, mm -hmm. it, it would be to realize that as you're combing through social, you're flipping through your Instagram feed, you're looking at all of your you know, competitors, is that there's an element to a distortion of reality on social media. We only see the best of everyone. We only see the win. We only see the successes. You know, there's, there's some moments where we share vulnerability and, and failure, but it's more of the, the best out there. Right? Right. People have no idea what goes on when someone's personal and professional life on a day-to-day -day behind closed doors. So mm -hmm. just when you think you know, just focus on what you know about yourself and not about what Joe Schmo is doing over there or what Sally, Sally Sam is doing over there. Focus <laughs> on what Max is doing. I'm focusing on what Chelsea is doing. So many people say, you know, how have you been able to keep going and doing? I don't care about what anybody else is doing in a competition matter. I only care about how I can collaborate with those people. And I really believe that that's such a fundamental mindset that we all should try to be achieving for ourselves because comparison envy is a real thing and it can really mm -hmm. help halt us from taking action. Oh, I don't have 10,000 followers, so I can't do that. Or Chelsea has how much media under her belt? I'll never get on TV. No, 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 no. Don't compare, just evaluate yourself, your skill set, your target demographic and what those needs are to provide the solution from there. Let's pivot to a fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. This is where you talk about a recent ad or marketing campaign that caught our attention and chat about it for a little bit. So earlier you were mentioning something from the Grammys, Chelsea. You want to chat about that for a little bit? Yeah, so I'm watching the Grammys and uh, there was a commercial that came on and I got so excited about it. it at, one of my favorite brands has always been Dove. Uh, I think that Dove does mm -hmm. such a beautiful job at bringing human interest stories and real people to life through their advertising and marketing campaigns. And I also think that they really tackle important issues, right, whether it's body positivity, confidence, empowerment. I saw one of my, like, favorite artists, uh, Kelly Rowland, with, a, with Dove partnering for a campaign called Hashtag My Hair, My Crown. And this concept, this, this campaign was all a brainchild off of, of course, Kelly Rowland growing up and having the qualms of being a girl and having hair that might not be like every other woman, and also a story that was sh shared of this beautiful African-American girl, so young, so beautiful, who got expelled from school because she had braid extensions in her hair. Crazy. It, 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 I like literally felt heat inside of me. I got so enraged as, as I heard this, as I heard this beautiful young woman speaking solely about her hair, and that's why she got expelled. I wanted to punch the TV. I, I really got so mad. <laughs> so, so all inspiring the hashtag my hair, my crown campaign, whether it's wearing your hair loud and proud, but also owning who you are, what, you know, the, it's the body, the hair that, you know, God or whoever you believe in gave you and feeling comfortable and powerful in your own skin. And whether, you know, it's bullying, discrimination, racism, um, I love that Dove really tackles these conversations in a, in a beautiful, empowering and collective way, right? So yeah. 
I happily posted my hair, my crown. Those are the campaigns and the, and the, and the initiatives that really excite me and, and get me going. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's a really, really strong one. And I totally agree. Dove is just unbelievable with their campaigns in that nature. And they're so empowering. I mean, they, they obviously they have, they have the famous one with the sketch artist from a while ago. They had a very successful campaign with Dwayne Wade. Yep. They've done so much and they just nail it every time. So on brand, super relevant way. Like, mm -hmm. and that's what I got to give them. In the props yeah. For. Exactly, yeah. in the best way. All right, so only a little bit of time left. We are going to wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A. Are you ready for it? Ready. All right, let's get wild. If you could only listen to one song and have it be the same song every time you listen to music for the rest of your life, what would it be? Shit, that's really hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Flying shit. <laughs> um, you know, okay, well, it's definitely going to be Beyonce. And okay. that's really hard. Because she's, you know, when it comes to like anthem, getting you going before you're like getting on stage or, you know, going to a meeting, it's always Beyonce for me. <laughs> she only has a couple songs, right? No. <laughs> only a couple. And I would say like my, my just feel good song is always Crazy in Love. But when I'm like need to mm -hmm. be like, like motivated, ramped up, like get my, get, you know, get my crown on, it's Who Run the World, girls. Oh, I, I, I had a feeling that was coming. Yeah, that's my song yeah. too. It just, anytime I'm on that treadmill and I'm like, I cannot go anymore, I just put that song on and I keep it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is your biggest pet peeve? And, you know, this is, okay, this is a selfish pet peeve then. Um, I guess <laughs> we like selfish pet peeves. That's what pet peeves are. So my biggest pet peeve is when um, I've heard that someone's made an assumption about me, whether it's, um, you know, that I'm nice, I'm not nice, I'm a bitch, I'm, I'm not a bitch, I run my my business or um, I don't run my business I hear all these things right through the grapevine and mm -hmm. then somebody will actually meet me have a conversation and go wow you're you're you know you're really nothing like um what I thought and I've heard that many 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 of times and I'm just like wow I, I wish people gave me a chance before they made an assumption yep and that goes to hey people are making assumptions from what they see right on Twitter, on Instagram, on my website. I like to think that I'm giving, you know, an authentic uh, version of myself online because what you see is what you get, let me tell you. Right. But the whole assumption thing just grinds my gears so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, grinds my gears. I never make assumptions until I met the person, spoke to the person, right. you know, then I make my opinion about it. So just right. like, Give people a chance, people. You know, people are so quick to like attack you on a comment or a, just you know. Do you know that person for you to be ripping them to shreds in that comment? You know nothing. You know mm -hmm. nothing. So I, I, the whole the meanness based off an assumption of a one post, a one comment. People need to chill that out. That's how it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you're dropping the mics all the time here. Uh, <laughs> okay, and then if you. Yeah, I guess a little different vein of a question. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Pizza. That's a great one. You kind of, you kind of, uh, oh, gosh. you broke the system there You, you <laughs> in a good way because <laughs> you can choose different toppings if you do that. So nice. Yeah, I'm usually pepperoni. <laughs> I'm going to pick a topping. It's got to be pepperoni pizza. There we go. All right. Making me hungry. This always happens. On <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you, Chelsea, so much. I mean, you shared so many amazing stories and great tips and wisdom as far as marketing, as far as starting a business or a brand. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was so much fun. You are so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And where's the best place for people to connect with you on social media? Yeah, well, all things at Chelsea Cross, so that's pretty easy. You know, Millennial Talk is Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, and definitely, um, I'd love to connect and, and stay in touch, stay, stay tuned. There's so many exciting things coming out in 2019. We have a cryptocurrency coin that just launched called CrossCoin, and our mission is to further empower women in business and create more VC funding and networking for, for women-led businesses. So it's empowerment, business, marketing, motivation is, is your cup of tea, then um, I'd love to connect because it's definitely mine. Bam. Yep. Got to try out the tea. All right. Final thoughts. <laughs> uh, you, have, you have a single line or quote you want to end on? Stage is yours. Just to wrap it, just send us off here. You are your only limit, period. And exclamation point. Thank you, Chelsea. That was a wonderful cup of tea. 
Thank you, wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. Whether you are a millennial or millennial at heart, here's the best ways to engage with the Wild Business Growth Podcast and Hippo Direct. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. On the site, we have tons of wild resources to help you grow your business. So visit hippodirect.com slash blog or hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest. It's your weekly recap of creative marketing. And don't forget to connect with us on your favorite social media platforms with the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter. That's a wrap for this episode. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!